So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> challenges them. Uh, um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asked by the believers as well as some of the disbelievers about him basically proving his words. You know, show us something. When is his promise going to come? And we mentioned that some of the benefits behind this that we as human beings, one of the things that we have as part of our desire is that we always like to see things in the forefront. We want to see, feel or touch something to know that it's real. But in the religion, the religion is based on a lot of spiritual upliftment. It's based on a lot of faith. It's based on an individual constantly working on the spiritual aspect of their heart and their uh, belief and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another, um, another benefit that we get from the same ayah is how the verse ends. In kuntum sadiqeen. Here is the part where the ulama, they say, this is what the disbelievers are saying to the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. In kuntum sadiqeen. If you happen to be people who are truthful. It's a type of istihza. It's a type of jest that they're making with the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. He's actually making fun of them. This is something that you and I, we go through each and every day by just being Muslim. People are going to constantly scrutinize you and ask you, you know, you really think that there's an afterlife? You really think that, you know, all of this is just happening by the will of a creator? You really think that all the Muslims and all the people dying all around the world is from a merciful creator? And they'll just try to pick out all of these strange gray areas and throw them at you. Why? Because they'll doubt the truthfulness in the religion. Why does Allah mention this even in the Qur'an in the first place? This is a way to affirm the truth in your heart. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, we talked about this where one of the wisdoms as to why we ask Allah Azza wa Jal at least 17 times a day, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim, Constantly keep us on the straight path is because the reality is even scholars themselves can live and live a beautiful academic scholarly life and achieve so much and still die as a disbeliever at the end of the day. And that's like one of the saddest, saddest realities ever to leaving this world. So here, Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to think, wants you to use your mind. Things are not always spelt out for us in the Quran. The Quran is a book of principles. It's a book of usul. It's a book that's going to give you the foundation and how to do a million different things in one sentence. So people always ask the question about smoking a cigarette. Where does it say in the Quran that I can't smoke a cigarette? It doesn't. It's not going to. It never will. It, there is no need for Allah Azza wa Jal to tell us don't smoke a cigarette. But what does Allah do? Allah Azza wa Jal gives us a foundation or a principle on how you build your lifestyle and that includes all of those filthy habits of like smoking of things like that. وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ I made certain things, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, all of the things that are good for you, beneficial for you, that are good not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, at all levels, these are the things that are halal and encouraged for you to take part in. وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ But I've made haram and prohibited for you the things that are khabaith. Khabaith, plural for khabith. Khabith means something that is stingy, something that smells really bad, something that if even in and of itself, its texture is really, really horrible. It's really rough. It's not pleasing to the eyes. It's not pleasing to the senses. It's not even pleasing to look at nothing. You don't want to even be around it anymore. How do you feel when you stand beside somebody who's smoking a cigarette and you don't? You automatically want to protect your children. You don't want them to be around that. You yourself, and we, we see the ads all the time, secondary smoke, smoke is even more harmful than the primary smoker himself. So all of these things, this is what the Quran does. It lays down usul or foundation of how you can build your lifestyle upon. So when Allah puts a verse like this, وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ It's a question for you to ask yourself as well, but in a positive light. 
When is all of this going to come to a reality? When is the promise of Allah Azza wa Jal going to come to a reality? When is the promise of Allah Azza wa Jal for all those individuals that were unjust, for all of those people that are causing the corruption and the fasad in this world, when is their time going to come in front of Allah Azza wa Jal? Listen to how, the, how Allah responds to this answer. قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ Period. So the Prophet ﷺ now responds to this claim. He doesn't just ignore it, which is the first uh, concept or the first sign whenever you get asked this question, respond to it. Be confident about it, but respond with hikmah and wisdom. What's hikmah and wisdom? It's hikmah and wisdom is not just saying, oh, Allah knows best, period. We know Allah who a'lam in everything. But here Allah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, look at his words that he uses. Allah tells him, قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Three emphases are happening here. إِنَّمَا is one emphasis. Al-ilm, so mentioning the, that knowledge in and of itself is with Allah is two. عِنْدَ اللَّهِ And it's with Allah, that's three. So three times Allah Azza wa Jal is emphasizing the same thing and that is Allahu A'lam is that is he knows best and then it stops there that's one half of a complete sentence there in and of itself قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ what this what the benefit for us here is whenever you get asked questions that you know you cannot answer and you know Islam does not provide an answer to it like a logical answer that people look for that people want then the easiest and the most productive and the most academic way to respond to those kinds of questions is you say, I have my morals, I have my ethics, I understand it this way, and you understand it this way, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. There are a number of subjects like this in the Quran. A number of subjects like this in the Quran where people will come and they will challenge you. And they will ask you about, for example, the people of Lut where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they were involved in a problem, in a sin that not even animals were doing. They were involved in a sin that no other nation and group of people have ever been involved, involved with ever. But Allah Azza wa Jal talks about what He did with those individuals and what happened to them. But the point here is, is that one may come and argue to you and say, well, there's no proof in the Qur'an that I shouldn't feel that way or and I shouldn't do this or and I shouldn't do that. And you may try to say, well, look what, how Allah destroyed the people of Lut and Lut was sent to them and this and that and this and that and it just keeps going back and forth. You're not going to get anywhere. And this is why at the end of the day, your response to this individual or to these groups of people, you have your way that you understand the Qur'an. But I have this way that I understand the Qur'an based on evidences. It's not your own logic. You just pull this out of your own head. But you have hadith, you have verses, you have wisdom to, to uh, affirm this belief. And I have this. And the ilm is left with Allah Azza wa Jal. And get yourself out of this conversation. That's the second benefit that you get. So the first benefit of how to respond to a question like this, keep it simple. The second benefit is keep it straightforward. When you don't have answers to a certain question, just get to the point and finish with that question. So for example, you remember the incident of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an, when the, the Jewish man came up to him and wanted to make fun of the religion of Islam. And he says to him that your prophet teaches you how to go to the washroom and how to bend down and this and that. Salman al-Farisi did not respond and say, yeah, it's true because, you know, if you sit a certain way, you know, it's good for the back, it's good for this and that. He doesn't do any of that. But what does he respond? And he says, one word. And he says, na'am, yes. Yes, that's what the Prophet ﷺ does. Yes, he taught me how to go to the washroom. Yes, my Qur'an and my religion teaches me how to walk. 
teaches me how to smile, teaches me how to do this, and teaches me how to do all the little things in my life. The Quran is the best thing, the best resource that I have that cares for every single aspect of my life, and I'm proud of that. So that's the second benefit that we get from this verse, is that you keep things simple and straight to the point. Don't always try to logicalize every single verse in the Quran, because it's not possible to do that. What you can do is extract benefits, but limit it to that as best as you can. And then the verse concludes, وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ Another triple emphasis. وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ And then the description of these three emphasis, مُبِينٌ So here the Prophet ﷺ now is telling these people who are asking and posing this question to him, look, all I can do is I can just... Now listen to the words of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, نَذِيرٌ he doesn't say, وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا خَبِيرٌ مُبِينٌ I'm not the person who can just tell you. But he uses the word nadir, which comes from the verb nadara, which means to warn someone and to caution an individual. So the Prophet Sallam is really not saying, all I can do is just tell you. He's not saying that. He's really saying, all I can do is just warn you which is a very, very different image that he creates with these people who ask him this question. I am just simply warning you of what's to come. I'm not just telling it to you like it's a story that's coming to me each and every day, but I'm warning you. It's a very, very profound point. Because what the Prophet ﷺ is indirectly doing here is he's still giving da'wah. He's basically saying to these people, don't ask a question like this. Why are you even questioning something like this? You can't see Allah. You can't communicate to Him directly. You can't hear His voice. You can't do any of these things in this world. So don't get into this dangerous area where you need to be asking these questions. And all I can do is, this is a nadir mubin. In the entire Quran, anytime the Prophet Sallam is being challenged with something to do with the knowledge of the unseen, with something to do of the unseen, he always responds like this, that إِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ He always cautions the questioner. He always responds and says, you shouldn't do that, or I warn you not to ask this question, or a punishment will come if you continue to do this. There's always some warning that follows when people try to question things that you can't see. So that's another, inshallah, uh, benefit that we get from the structure of this particular verse. Then it continues. فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهُ زُلْفَةً سِيئَتْ وُجُوهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَقِيلَ هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تَدَّعُونَ Very, very profound um, a verse. فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهُ زُلْفَ Now here, the Zulfa, according to the majority of the Mufassirun, again, there are a number of opinions of what the word Zulfatun is talking about here. Some of the ulama, they said that Zulfa here means that you see the punishment of Allah getting closer to you. That's one verse, uh, sorry, one uh, narration. A second narration is um, that you just simply see the adab or the punishment in and of itself in front of you. So it's not getting closer to you, but you just see the image of the adab. It's there and the reality has made itself clear to you. And then another one is the punishment of Yawmul Qiyamah in and of itself. And then the next one is the adab in uh, Ghazwatul Badr or the punishment that happened to the Sahabas on the Battle of Badr. And we will pause inshallah.